Well, good morning, everybody, and, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to the meeting. It's uh, very exciting, and I, I feel like a little bit of a technology dinosaur in this room. Uh, we haven't been doing this stuff too long. Um, but one of the things that we uh, became very interested was the, the value of it. Uh, I think everybody's aware that uh, technology is booming, but is it actually uh, uh, worth the money? So we're going to talk today a little bit about some of those concepts. And uh, I think my disclosures are important here. Um, I do do work for Medtronic, uh, and I get royalties from Medtronic. None, none of my royalties are related to this uh, particular talk. And the other disclosure is that uh, this was uh, partially funded, but independently uh, from Medtronic as well. And these are two of my colleagues who did the majority of the work on the study that just came out in the, uh, the Spine Journal earlier uh, this year. So uh, they are the backbone and the, uh, the workers behind this paper. And these were the objectives that were given to me by <coughs> the program committee. And I'm, I'm hopeful that at the end of this talk uh, that you guys will uh, uh, have a little more information about uh, the cost and, and benefits of this particular technology. So what do we know about navigation or computer-assisted surgery now? Um, well, there's some, some stuff we know from the literature, and there's others that just theoretically make sense. And I think every time you use it, you kind of create a little different uh, nuance that, that helps you do a particular procedure uh, better. I do a lot of uh, oncology work and on-block resections for primary tumors, and certainly my osteotomy cuts are a lot better now than they than they used to be. And then there's going to be talks later about radiation exposure. And I think it's excellent to teach residents and fellows with this technology. I'm certainly, when residents are doing something um, with instrumentation, I'm much more comfortable now than I used to be when I had uh, real-time feedback. So I think there's a lot of benefits. But as I said, the one thing that is out there in the literature is that accuracy is better, and I think we, we can confirm that, and now there's, there's literature supporting that it doesn't really take more time to do it once you get the process up and running. So I think the literature is supporting that. And if it seems so great, why has it not become the standard? Why isn't every hospital, every surgeon using it? Now, more are, but clearly it, it's not become the standard of care yet. And they did this survey back in 2012 asking 3,000 surgeons why they didn't use it. And there was the typical macho surgeon shit about, well, I don't need it, I'm just so good. And Pat was alluding to that 10% that shouldn't be operating. And, uh, but the main reason was the high capital costs. This stuff's expensive. And that really is the, the, the fundamental thing. And that sort of spurned us on to thinking, you know, well, how can we prove that it is? It seems so great, we've got to start providing data and evidence that it is cost effective. And that's what sort of created this, this study that we did. So the purpose was to perform a cost effective analysis. And <clears throat> with scarce healthcare resources now, this is what it's all about. This is the new trend. We, people want to know how much it costs. And we thought it would be associated with decreased costs and better outcomes once a certain case threshold is met. If you're doing two cases a year, and you know that's probably not going to be cost effective. So you, so you have to put it in that setting. And we have had a long time prospectively collected database at Vancouver General Hospital. We're about two, two and a half hours up the I-5 freeway. And, and uh, every Wednesday, we meet for three hours, all the surgeons, all the residents, all the fellows. And all our data is entered. It's very, very high quality data. And uh, so it's, a, it's been going on now for almost 16 years, uh, entering this uh, data. So we have the data, and um, we wanted to look at two particular groups. We started using navigation in 2008. So we have two distinct cohorts, one where we used x-ray or fluoro in the years previous, and then from 2008 on, uh, navigation. And then we matched these two groups based on the typical variables that you would match on. And, uh, and then we would have two comparison groups. And our primary effectiveness measure 
was the number of reoperations per year. And this was kind of difficult to come up with. Like, we don't have qualities for this stuff. That's, that's really straightforward when you're doing economic work. But we had to come up with some measure. So we thought that reoperation, we could attach a cost to that. So that was, a, that was a critical piece to come up with. And we also looked at adverse event rate, surgical time, length of stay, which you would expect. We did this paper in 2011, which showed our adverse event rate was up in the 70% range, which created a bit of a shock. It won the NASA award. And the reason it's so high is we prospectively collect it. And I think that's well established in the literature now that our adverse event rate is really high. It's not just our center. And what about the costing analysis? Well, we looked at it from the hospital perspective because really the hospital is purchasing this. Now, our healthcare system is considerably different than yours. And we could discuss that later, but it's still fundamentally the hospital that's purchasing this. And then reoperation costs, we used a micro costing approach, very detailed, you know, x ray, pharmacology, OR time, all those sorts of things. We have that model to do that. So that's fairly accurate costing. And then, of course, there's the capital costs of the navigation. In this, in this case, it was ORMS 7, but any system you might have, I think we can apply it across the board. And then we looked at the annuitization of these expenditures over time or amortization of these, picking various five, 10 years uh, out from the uh, capital cost expenditure. Now, for those of you who don't understand a lot about economic analysis and things, you can do what's called an inter incremental cost effectiveness ratio. And I probably, for you Americans, I probably should have used a Tesla and a Ferrari or something, but we'll stick with the Canadian routine here. But if your outcome is horsepower and you want to know what if the extra miles per hour are worth it, and you want to compare these two particular cars, you can look at the cost of the Audi versus the cost of the Mini Cooper and then the effects of the Audi and the effects of the Mini Cooper. And there's the price differences across the top, and there's the maximum speed across the bottom. So if you want to pay almost 1500 bucks for each mile up per hour gained, you've got an idea of what the cost is for that particular thing. So is that good value for your money? The Teslas are fast, too. So here are the results of our study. And I, I would, you know, we don't have time to go through all, all the nitty gritty, but you can see the accuracy rate there, 95.2 with the, the navigation and, and about 86 in the conventional way. And the bottom one is the key thing here. 0.8% had to be taken back in the navigation group and 6% in the conventional group. So a 5.2% difference between the two techniques with respect to revisions occurring in one year. The majority occurring in the initial admission, not coming back. There were a few that came back in the conventional group. So when you look at that from an ICER perspective and run those particular numbers, the cost of the computer assisted surgery, cost of a C-arm, it came down to about $16,000 per reoperation. So that's what it's worth to avoid a reoperation. Charles, those would be hospital costs as opposed to charges in US like that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to cover that in a, in a sec. But yeah, more or less, it's, it's, the, it's the capital costs of, of the equipment. And then uh, um, and I'll, you'll see in a minute the, the other piece. So, so that's what it costs. So it's easy. You know, we have this threshold of $50,000 for a quali. Well, this isn't a quality. Who knows what the threshold is for operation avoided? But, but that's what it comes out to. And then if, if you start to look, and this, that's just the ratio. Now if you start to run it for your particular hospital and look what a cost of a reoperation is, you know, $12,500 in, in Canada, and this is the additional cost of the... Of the um, navigation per annum, all right, per year, we need to do 13.2 reoperations for it to be cost saving. 
And with this 5.2% difference, we have to do 254 cases a year for this to be cost effective. Like I said earlier, if you only do four cases, it's not going to be cost effective. So the number of cases you do is a key variable here since you're avoiding reoperations. The more cases you do, the more likelihood you're going to be taking patients back. So that was sort of the cost effective threshold for us. And then if you look at USA costs, which I know is far, far more complicated than our single payer system in Canada. But if we use Medicare uh, reimbursement schedule for this, and the number of cases was much less. So at an American center, based on this information, you would only have to do 168 cases to break even. So it's almost better down here because the cost of a reoperation was over twice what the cost of a reoperation is in Canada. So I don't, that doesn't totally answer your question, David, but it, it kind of puts it in perspective. And we don't have to get into every sensitivity analysis that we did for this particular paper, but I think the take-home message here is that you can run different numbers through this in the extreme. So reoperation rate, run it from 48% for the conventional group, run it zero to 2%. And you will see that the ICER varies. Remember it was about 16,000 and when you start to plug in different numbers, you can see a range from 11,000 to 25,000. So there's lots of ways you can look at this and fine tune this information to your particular situation. Maybe your revision rate or take back rate is, is less than ours. Maybe it's more. You can, you can vary this to see if it, if it makes sense for your institution to use navigation. And that's the beauty of this. You can run all these things. You can look at number of cases. And that will have an effect. And again, you can see the, the range, 12,000 to 20,000, 21,000 for the number of cases. The amortization period of that capital, initial capital cost, whether it's 5, 10, 15 years, doesn't seem to influence it as much as the number of cases. But this is a, a great way to, to plug in numbers and see if it's the right thing for you. So we thought this was a fairly rigorous study um, to look at, look at this, and we think we, we chose a fairly good outcome measure. But there's obviously lots of other outcome measures one could, could focus on. But it was really the first, there's been some other papers out there that have delved into this, but this was a pretty, uh, I think, robust economic evaluation. Nick, who I told you, this was his kind of master's thing when he was at the London School of Economics. So. Um, uh, he got a, an A on the paper. Um, so, you know, it did cover the basis as best that we could do. And I think we tended to bias towards the null hypothesis in the methodology. So we, um, we included, you know, all the capital costs, all the maintenance costs. Now, there are nuances. I mean, every company, you know, you just don't pay this for a particular machine. There's always sort of different packaging and things. So it's hard. We have to use the straight capital cost, but obviously there's variabilities uh, there. And it wasn't just screw malposition, although we, we graded all of them. We didn't really look at that because often we leave screws that aren't in place if they're not causing any particular problems. It's just the revisions. And, you know, we use this, we didn't strictly use this in a way where every surgeon used navigation exactly the same way. Like I was brutal initially, like I'd just use the pointer, I wouldn't guide the bonker, I mean, you know, because I'd put in, you know, I was the guy who, who why would I want to use this? I'm, I already know I can put in screws. But, so there was that generalizability that not everybody used it in the same precise way. And I think that's important for generalizability. You don't want to and so that, to me, biases, again, towards the null hypothesis, which is good. And we haven't even looked at neurologic injury that could result or construct failure that could result and all the other potential advantages of using navigation, right? We've just focused on one. So there's probably more and more. That clock's right, right? I'm good? Yeah, okay. I was at a big meeting once, and the clock was off, and I thought it was on time, so... Anyway, um, so I think there's lots of uh, there's lots of 
of advantages that we don't even include in this. But the question is, how do you quantify those in, a, in an economic analysis? And that's why we picked the one thing. And we didn't even address, and Dave, you might have, this is another thing about the indirect costs. We didn't even look at that, about the health-related quality of life of a patient coming back to hospital, disruption of work, length of stay. We didn't even look at that. So these are other things that I think are biases, again, towards the null hypothesis. So uh, I think the results are very favorable. Uh, there are limitations. We didn't have rigid inclusion exclusion. We tried to match as uh, obviously as best we could. No, um, there was no blinding. I mean, it was a prospective, you know, cohort with a historical control. And we're at a highly specialized quaternary referral center, right? Um, we deal with a lot of trauma, a lot of tumors, a lot of deformity. It's not just degenerative. So again, it enhances generalizability. But if you're at a primary degenerative <laughs> center, then perhaps this information isn't applicable. So I think when we go back to our, you know, goals here, I think this study demonstrates that it is cost effective, but it's not cost effective necessarily for every institution. And you have to look at your revision rate, and you have to look at the number of cases that you're doing. But I think if you're in a high volume center, like our center is, and many of you are from, then it is cost effective, and you also get all the other benefits um, of using navigation that we've already alluded to. So thanks very much. <laughs>